Well, Mark Welker, Cape Girardeau County Prosecuting Attorney, thank you so much for being here today. We are we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that you discussed with the Gun Violence Task Force a couple of weeks ago. Yep. And uh, so we want the opportunity for the community to hear everything that you said. And we had a little audio issue before, so we're going to we'll try it again. So uh, I'm Jessica Hill. I'm the executive director of the Safe House of Southeast Missouri and the co-chair of the Gun Violence Task Force. I'm Mark Welker, Cape Girardeau County Prosecuting Attorney. I have been prosecutor since 2018, whenever I was elected the first time. I was re-elected in 2022. I do plan on seeking re-election in 2026, Great. so in a couple of years. Excellent. So let's start, as we did last time, with an overview of your office and how the prosecutors serve the county. Yes, yeah, so my office, we serve Cape Girardeau County. There is a city prosecutor for both Jackson City and Cape City. Most people don't realize that there are multiple different offices that service the area. Um, my office, we have nine assistant prosecutors and then myself. So 10 prosecutors total in Cape Girardeau County uh, in our office. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, 22 other staff members so we have a quite uh, a, a large staff uh, in southeast Missouri, anywhere between St. Louis to Greene County, that's Springfield, we're the largest office uh, in that area. Our budget is $1.9 million. Of that, $1.3 million goes to just paying uh, the salaries of our staff. Um, it's quite an undertaking of just doing the budget. So most people think that what my job is just prosecuting cases, but it's actually just also managing the office. Um, so what does the, uh, our office really handle? Um, that could be anything between a, a speeding ticket uh, in the county, all the way up to a felony murder. Um, we file anywhere between 3,000 to 3,500 cases a year, and that's in Cape Girardeau County. So like I was telling you, we service Cape Girardeau City, Jackson City, all the way from Delta to Daisy to Fruitland, anything that's in Cape Girardeau County. There is a portion of Scott City that people don't realize that uh, is in Cape Girardeau County. We do uh, handle some of those. Um, but the main, um, main portion of Cape Girardeau County lies uh, is in Cape, Cape Girardeau City. That agency, Cape Girardeau Police Department, refers those cases to us. Um, we also handle the Cape Girardeau uh, Sheriff's Department cases, Jackson City Police Department the Missouri State Highway Patrol. We would get cases from uh, Missouri Department of Conservation, so we might get a, a case from them for um, uh, illegally fishing. Um, we might get cases from uh, the health and senior service cases for elder abuse. Mm -hmm. um, so of that 3,3500 cases, we have a wide range of possibilities that we might be filing. So our prosecutors have to be on top of what we are handling. So um, the probably the most common case that we do file of those is the felony possession of a controlled substance, most commonly is methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. The range of punishment of that um, is a D felony, uh, which is up to seven years in the Department of Corrections. Um, so that's kind of an um, overview of the office, uh, what we handle, who we get cases from. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So I know one of the positions that you have in your office that was of interest to the task force is your victim advocate. So can you talk about their role? Yes, so any time that we have a victim uh, that is in a case, then we have our victim advocate that works closely with your office. 
Um, she is assigned a case uh, whenever a prosecutor determines that she is needed. Um, that victim advocate then uh, meets with the victim, determines um, she goes over what the victim's rights are in the cases, make sure that they understand what the judicial process is, uh, to make sure they completely understand what is um, moving forward their expectations, which is very key um, in helping out with our cases because one of the main issues with um, with cases that I think is subject of, of this task force are violent crimes or gun cases is victim cooperation right. um, and and having that um, having the individual in our, in our office that helps make sh making sure that they stay cooperative is a very vital in making sure that we can continue to prosecute those cases. Mm -hmm. um, we have found that having your office, your organization, um, really um, get involved with the victims um, immediately, then in passing them off or working in uh, as a partnership with our office um, has maintained um, a level that uh, keeps the victims engaged in the process. Mm -hmm. um, without that, then they just kind of fall off the radar and get dissatisfied and they no longer want to um, participate. And as soon as they become um, unwilling to participate in the case, then we can no longer prosecute. Right. Um, I think a lot of people don't understand the the general judicial process um, where they get their knowledge of the court system either through TV or mm -hmm. books or, yeah. or social media where frankly that's just not how the court system works. Mm -hmm. um, I welcome anyone, please come and watch. Um, we're, we're very open to the public um, right now, we probably have 100 cases going on right now in the courthouse. Just come and watch us. We are uh, diligently working with uh, probably three courtrooms almost every day, juggling what's going on. The majority of people uh, don't come and watch. The majority of the people that are in the courtroom have to be there either as a defendant, a victim, or a witness. The people that want to stay, that want to have information of the cases, they get the information through other means. They don't actually participate by coming and watching. Um, so th the actual judicial process is if I want to proceed with prosecution, if my office wants to actually proceed with the case, we actually have to have someone present the evidence on the stand. Mm -hmm. It can't just simply be one of us just telling the judge or telling the jury this is what happened. Right. Um, evidence has to be presented and I think that is lost on individuals. So it's a, it's a struggle. Um, trying to figure out how to present cases. Um, now, th that is something that we are working through. Um, that's not something that really the, this task force can really help with. Um, it, it's something that our organization, prosecutors across the state, um, has been dealing with from the inception of, of the judicial system. Mm -hmm. Right. So. so a couple of things that you um, mentioned to our task force that, that you are not completely under your purview but affect your work. One is the jail population and the other is sentencing. Yes. So, so can you talk about those two issues? The jail, um, this is how I know that everyone in at least the judicial system all the way from law enforcement to our judges are, are trying to do the right thing with 
the law enforcement, um, they are respond, responding to cases, um, referring over cases, my office charging the people, the judges uh, holding the people through their bonds. Um, our jail is sitting at roughly around 300 as of today. I think whenever I went and spoke uh, a couple weeks ago, it was around 315. We hover around that number depending on every day it, it, it fluctuates. That is way over capacity of, of what we have been. Thankfully, the county commission has decided that we need to adjust. We need to do something about that. So we have a new jail that, um, that they decided to build a couple of years ago that will be opening up I believe sometime in the spring. Mm -hmm. The capacity of that jail will be around 500. Um, so we won't be over capacity, um, but we won't have to make tough decisions about whether or not who we will be holding in the jail. Mm -hmm. um, we have to, it's a daily struggle um, on whether or not this person will be uh, in custody or that person will be in custody. We no longer have to worry about that um, it, because it is, it is a struggle right now. The people that are in custody right now need to be in custody. Right. They need to be in jail. Um, I think previously you heard from Judge Lewis about the Department of Corrections and their, their bed space. It's the same number as, uh, um, that they've only decreased. Um, their bed space. I don't think that there will be an increase in their bed space anytime soon. And that's fallen on the county to have to, exactly, it's trickled down to us and we have to do something about that. Um, and luckily our county commission has decided to do something about that. And so one thing that um, we can ask for, um, through our legislature is for truth in sentencing. Um, that could force a increase in bed size at Department of Corrections in prison. Um, some people might not realize what I'm talking about with Department of Corrections and county jails. So a county jail is at the county level. Department of Corrections is once someone is actually sentenced, then they are sentenced to prison. That's the Department of Corrections. And sentencing, once someone is sentenced, on their case with us, then it, it's a magical number of how long that they'll actually serve. Right. Um, there's no true guidelines of how long someone will actually serve unless it's by statute. There are certain numbers, um, there are certain offenses that are 85% or 50% or, um, but those are very few cases that that uh, those people will actually serve those. And those are violent offenses. However, the majority of cases, like I was telling you that we file are uh, methamphetamine cases, that it doesn't matter how many times we might uh, file cases on an individual for felonies that aren't violent offenses. They will go to the Department of Corrections. The parole board might decide it might be 15% of their sentence that they have to serve. So if someone is given a seven year sentence, then likely they will only serve nine months, eight months on that seven year sentence. And during that time, they will get credit for the, the time they've already served in our county jail, which likely has meant that they've already spent that time because they've gone through our judicial process of once they're arrested, a bond is, um, once that warrant is served, the bond has been set by the judge and they're waiting for to either plead guilty or been um, convicted by their judge or jury, then the amount of time bef between that is likely about six to eight months. Mm -hmm. Well, when they're actually sentenced and to the Department of Corrections and then the probation and parole has determined that it's only a 15% uh, crime, they're released back into our, into our community. Right. 
the the way to combat that would be a th truth in sentencing law, which we have had our local state reps support that, mm -hmm. um, but it's supporting them in trying to get that passed. Right. Um, and I think that if that happens, it will force uh, to open up more beds in the Department of Corrections, just like our county commission has decided that they needed to do um, to help combat some of the crime issues that we've seen at the local level. It, it will be costly, um, but I think it is needed. Yeah. I think that Judge Lewis, when he came to talk to the task force, he said it was essentially a one out before you could put one in with the Missouri Department of Corrections. That is it's correct. so full. It, it's trying to determine who needs to be in and who needs to be out. Um, and it, it is an issue. Um, but this at least would force them to no longer play games on uh, percentages. It's a, if a judge sentences them to five years, they're gonna serve five years, or it's at least people will know what they're gonna be serving. Mm -hmm. So in terms of crimes that involve uh, gun violence that you see, um, I know you talked about illegal use of guns and illegal possession of guns. Can you talk about those? So, um, I think what I ran the stats the last time I was here, we had around 46 cases that involved guns in my office um, last year. That number's probably closer to about 50 right now. Um, we had one just this morning. Um, those, um, those cases run anywhere between a uh, individual that could be shooting a firearm, they could possess a, a stolen firearm, they could be a, a felon in possession of a firearm. The cases that we probably see the most of of those are felons in possession of a firearm. Um, and those cases are, uh, they could be a D felony, they could be a, a C felony, depending on the prior felony. Um, we have seen a lot more of the individuals committing these crimes at a younger age, um, anywhere between. So my office, we do not handle any juvenile cases. Right. We only um, handle them once they hit 18. But we have seen a lot more of the individuals at the age of 18 to probably 22, 23. Once they, they're older, um, they do have uh, felonies. We do see some of those, but the majority of people that we see uh, with these gun cases are around that age. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the topics that we covered when you were here with the task force was essentially how to prevent violence and strengthen the criminal justice system. And one of the things that was mentioned, in addition to things you've already talked about here today, is cameras. So can you talk about how you utilize cameras and, and the benefit of, of cameras in our communities? Yeah, so what I was talking about earlier about witness cooperation, um, it, that is a huge issue of ours when presenting cases. Um, we have had success in our office with um, when we are, do not have witness cooperation. However, using cameras instead whether it is security cameras at businesses, whether it's uh, uh, security cameras at residences' homes, um, it, it gives us the ability to at least present evidence in court. Um, without that, we have nothing. So the, the cameras at least gives us a shot to prosecute the cases. Um, with that, we can have cameras that, if we don't have well-lit areas, if we have um, cameras that don't go back t in time, uh, we have had issues where there is a camera, but once we go to that camera, well, they don't have the storage. Um, but the actual use of cameras have been very vital in multiple cases now involving guns that um, the city of Cape has done a, a great job with technology now with the flock system, um, 
where officers have been able to respond quicker to actual gun cases where uh, shots are fired. However, the majority of the time, the people don't stay there once shots are fired. The officers have to collect as much information as possible. Um, and one of that, that the evidence that is much needed is the, the cameras. Yeah. yeah, so I think the, the task force has been pretty impressed with some of these developments that between the city and Cape Verde PD, we, they've been in, um, installing and, and introducing into our community. So there's the flock system that looks at license plates that can track those. There's the shot spotter that can tell us when shots were fired. Yep. And it seems like cameras could be kind of the a third leg there of that stool that would um, provide more data to the police as well as to you. Yes. So I think that's something that we look at as a possible action item, you know, something that the city could work toward would be installing more cameras, encouraging business owners and, and residents to install cameras in well-lit areas with, uh, with accurate or um, adequate storage. So that might be something that we're able to look at more in the future. So can you talk about a little bit about recidivism and prior persistent offenses that you see in your office? Yes, yeah, so it, I've been now in my position about six years, um, and I would say the majority of our uh, defendants are, are individuals that we see over and over again. Uh, I don't have the exact number on it. It's, it's just the perception that it's either the same individuals or it's the same family of individuals that are committing the crimes. Um, it's very rare that we'll see someone that is, doesn't have a criminal history. If it is someone that doesn't have a criminal history, it's likely that they are young, that they either 18, 19 years old, and this might just be their first offense on the way to multiple more offenses, and we'll see down the line. Um, it, we're now seeing a lot more of, well, I've, I prosecuted them in whenever I first started in 2018, and they might now be in DOC, and now I'm starting to prosecute their, their family members, their, their children. Um, so we're seeing a lot more of the just frequent flyers. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you addressed with the task force was the role that mental health challenges play um, in some of these gun-related crimes. Um, and one of the things we talked about was the possibility of a mental health court that would be similar to the, the treatment court that we already have in place in the community. So can you talk about the role of mental health and, and the possibility of a mental health court? Mental health is a huge issue that I think is growing not only in our community but across this, the entire country that um, I don't know necessarily if it is gun related. I think it is just a crime related issue that almost all of our cases now has some mental health aspect to them. Um, that before, whenever I started, we might only see someone that had mental health concerns very rarely. Now we probably have 20 individuals that are in our jail population that are waiting for mental health evaluations. Um, and our majority of our individuals that um, either we file trespassing charges on, stealing charges, um, we do have several violent crime um, defendants that there are mental health components to those cases. Th those are the ones that um, we need to get to the root of the problem. I don't know what that is. I'm not a mental health professional. Um, but I do know that there needs to be something that we need to put in place. If it is a mental health court, like we do have a drug court that is successful, um, then I would I would love to see that. Now, whether or not it, that's feasible, I don't know. Right. Yep. I think it's something worth looking into and something that was of interest to the task force. So, 
alternatively, you were asked at the meeting about the intersection of gun violence and homelessness. Um, and would you share what your thoughts are on that? We don't necessarily necessarily see a lot of cross between uh, violent crime and homelessness. Um, the what we see with the homeless or transient population is more of trespassing, stealing, mm -hmm. um, drug related offenses. The the violent crimes that we see are more associated with. Um, people that are associated to the area. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that there's a, a gun um, violence related issue with the homeless population. If there is, then it's more of people that might be um, searching vehicles for guns. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have a, a large issue with our population that leave car doors unlocked. When they do that, then um, we do have an issue with the homeless population going around and um, just searching through vehicles and finding whatever they can and then using whatever they find to sell on the streets um, to, to then profit to, and, and one of those is, is guns. And those guns end up in bad people's hands. Right. I think that was very eye-opening for those of us on the task force. Um, Acting Chief Glick had mentioned as part of that conversation that it's about once a week that a gun stolen from an unlocked car is reported. Um, and I think that's something that's that's obviously very addressable, you know, and, and an opportunity for awareness that, that the city can do to really encourage people, A, don't store your gun in your car, and B, lock your car. Yes. So. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. <clears throat> so I know that you are, in addition to um, your work here with, with the county, you're um, very active with the, is it the Missouri Association of Prosecuting Attorneys? Yes. So can you tell us what other cities in the state are seeing and, and how that is either similar or different from what we're seeing in Cape Girardeau? Yes, yeah, so I think that what we're seeing is um, what the larger cities, Kansas City, St. Louis, Springfield is what they were going through years ago. Um, we're just now seeing it um, at our level and we're now dealing with it. And we can't really take the models of what those larger cities, uh, what they were doing. We have to look at the models of what Joplin, Jefferson City, um, what they're doing. and. To be honest, we're just now dealing with the same things at the same time. There's really not the models in place. Mm -hmm. We have to be innovative ourselves and work together. Um, and, and we are at the state level. Uh, we talk frequently about what do we see. And it, it's just now popping up in our areas. Um, and, and we do talk to the larger cities as well, but unfortunately, like I was saying, we are different. We aren't, we aren't the St. Louis's, right. we aren't the Kansas cities. We are very, we're more similar to the Springfield areas, but again, we're, we're not that. So um, to try to, to base a, a model that works out of Missouri, there really isn't one yet. So the hope is maybe that we can, be in the forefront and maybe work together with those other similar sized cities to to come together right. to do that. Right. We have a real opportunity here, I think, in our community. So uh, lastly, one of the things that you mentioned that I think <clears throat> was meaningful to our task force was you're raising a family in Cape Girardeau. Yes. I'm raising a family in Cape Girardeau. And well, you just, you just yeah, and you just talked about um, sort of your sense of the safety of our community um, in light of your family and that kind of thing, if you would share that. Yes, so I was born and raised here, um, went away for school, but um, moved back. I don't plan on leaving. Uh, like I said, I, I plan on running for re-election here. Um, I, I feel safe here. I feel like my, my family feels safe here. Um, there is 
a, a you know, if you if you go on social media, you you think that this is a, a war zone. There are places that I won't go and visit at certain times of the day. However, you have to be cognizant of your surroundings. And, but that's anywhere. Right. That's not just isolated to, to Cape Girardeau. Mm -hmm. That's not just, and that, that could be anywhere in our county. That could be anywhere in Southeast Missouri. I know that there's places that I won't go to. Um, and you just have to be, um, like I said, cognizant of your surroundings. But at the end of the day, that I know that this is a place and a community that I want to raise my kids in. Great. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time today to sit down with us and, and cover um, some of the things that we talked about at our task force meeting. Um, we want to thank our viewers who have tuned in to see this today. Um, thank you for your interest in the gun violence task force and the work of the city in this area. Um, we ask that if you uh, have questions that you'd like to see the task force address, that you would go to cityofcape.org slash GVTF and submit those. We're very interested in your feedback and we look forward to continuing this process. So thank you very much, Mark thank Walker. You. Thank you.